Hi, I'm Kate Arthur, editor at large at Variety Magazine. Part of our Power of Women conversations, I'm speaking with the women behind the production company Freckle Films, founder, actor, and producer Jessica Chastain, and president of production Kelly Carmichael. Thank you both so much for being here. Jessica, I'd like to ask you first about the formation of Freckle Films. Why did you want to go into producing? Was there something that was lacking in the roles that you were being offered? Uh, well, it wasn't necessarily about the roles I was being offered. It was about the opportunities that I saw in the industry. And I think the failings that I saw in the industry in terms of inclusion and in terms of stories about women, uh, that's something that I really lacked that I thought, I think the industry lacked. I felt it as an audience member, actually even more so than I felt it as an actress. So I did, I remember for the Critics' Choice, I received an MVP award um, for my films that year. And so I made, you know, my speech was kind of about, you know, needing inclusion in, in our industry. And then right after that, I went and did some press in London. And the journalist asked me, asked me, you know, we, we loved your speech. You know, what are your plans <laughs> now, you know, on creating in, in inclusivity? And I thought, well, okay, here I go. I, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is and I need to start now uh, creating a company that will offer some opportunities for women and also highlight the stories that perhaps have been unheard and invisible. And then how did you meet Kelly? I met Kelly through, I, I believe it was Paul Nelson, my manager, sent me an email first, um, you know, telling me about her and very, you know, we had a, a meeting that went great and immediately I started getting all these emails from people who had worked with Kelly, you know, telling me how amazing she is. And my response was, yeah, I know. <laughs> We're gonna work together. Um, so it was it was a pretty seamless, um, I think, uh, collaboration and connection between us. Kelly, you have a background working in an independent film, having been at the Weinstein Company. What made you wanna join forces with Jessica? I just loved everything she had done up into the, you know, as an actress. And it's funny, I got an email from a casting director, um, A.V. Kaufman, who we've worked with. And she said, would you ever be interested in partnering with an actress? And I was like, who? Um, and she just wrote back JC. And I was like, oh, forget it. I can't like set me up. I would love to take that meeting. And that's true. Like we had like a three hour meeting. <laughs> yeah. It was super, it was very comfortable from the beginning. Yeah. Totally. Um, and Kelly, you worked for Meryl Poster when you yeah. first started in Hollywood. Did working for a female producer help you navigate your way in the industry? I think it, it became what I knew. You know, I saw this woman who had a ton of power and was, you know, making these great movies and someone who had a family and she had two kids and I saw how you could sort of be able to try to do that. I mean, it's incredibly hard, but I, I had a great, you know, front row seat at someone who was doing it. And I, it was my first job, so I didn't know any better. You know, I was like, well, she's the president of production. There must be more of them. <laughs> so let's talk about the genesis of the 355, your movie your first movie, which is slated to be released at the beginning of next year. And it was introduced to buyers at Cannes in 2018 and has been kind of a bellwether project for financing female-led films in the industry. How did the idea first come to you to make this movie? Uh, well, I was on the jury at Cannes and uh, you know, every year at Cannes you see the posters of films that are there you know, securing their financing in their um, foreign sales. And there's always every year a ton of posters and spectacle regarding um, male action ensemble films. And I was talking to my agent and I said, you know, why don't they ever put an ensemble of women together? I long to work with other actresses. There's so many people that I admire, but it feels like the industry doesn't want us in a room together. <laughs> why, why do they never uh, make stories with a, with a group of women? Talking to Hilda, you know, we discussed like the way to do it is if you were to work with actresses from all over the world, you can raise the um, foreign sales and that then budgets your film, that, that gives you the budget for your film. 
So that's what we did. I put a wish list together of uh, everyone that I had longed to work with. I mean, that list is very long. So there are other films I hope to work with other actresses as well. And um, they all said yes. Everyone that I had asked, all the other actresses I had asked to be a part of it were excited to be a part of it. So on the very first call, they said yes. And um, I said, the only thing is if you say yes, you're an owner of the film, which means you have to come to Cannes to sell the film. And they did. Wow. Tell us the story about assembling the cast. Well, um, I mean, the cast was assembled basically just as I had said, and we'd gone right. through different iterations and um, of story. We, you know, Teresa Rebeck, who I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but she is, I think, the most produced female playwright uh, in the United States. She's an incredible playwright who I studied uh, in theater school. She wrote our script. And, you know, we all went to Cannes and sold the film. I believe we broke some records, you know, with Simon Kinberg, our director. And then, so we, I had the idea in Cannes. Then the next year we went and sold the film in Cannes. And then the next year we were shooting in Paris and London. Um, and our cast is uh, Penelope Cruz, Lupita Nyong'o, Fan Bingbing, Diane Kruger, and myself, in addition with Sebastian Stan and Edgar Ramirez. The men. <laughs> um, yeah, mm -hmm. um, our eye candy. <laughs> uh, and you chose Simon Kinberg to direct the film. Why did you go with a male director? Because for me, you know, Simon has always been such an incredible um, ally in terms of inclusivity and supporting stories about women and, and also supporting women in our industry behind the scenes. He's such a phenomenal producer. He really knows uh, the ins and outs of putting a film together and, and about story, uh, incredible, um, you know, writer. He, he wrote Mr. and Mrs. Smith. That was his first project, I think, right in college. Mm. So for me, it was a sense of when I first brought it up to him, I was telling him this idea and he just said, I want to do it. I want to do it. And I was like, oh my gosh, how incredible. So, you know, we have two female producers, one male producer, Simon, we have a female writer and we have five lead female um, actresses in the cast. And I figured it was okay to allow the men to show up to support uh, this, this women's story. So I, I like an idea of balance on a set. Um, can you talk about what the movie is about? It's been so vague and mysterious and intriguing in all of the reporting on the movie. Yeah, the film is about, um, it's an espionage film, an international espionage film about these rival agents who need to come together and get over their personal differences in order to save the world from a um, deadly cyber threat. So uh, what I love about this story is it doesn't feel nationalistic. <laughs> There's something very international about it. Uh, and these people from all over the world come together um, in search of a common good. And I like that kind of storytelling, especially right now. And one thing that is, I think super interesting that I feel like is very specific to this movie was because the cast was assembled, Jessica and the other actresses talked about what roles they would want to play in this world, right? It's like, we're going to make a spy movie. And it was really particular about, you know, just working with the women and figuring out, well, what do you want to do? What do you want to play on screen? What kind of character? You, and I just think that's so, that's what was driving us, not like the plot of, okay, well, we have to do these things. It was really about building characters. Yeah, you for example, like Penelope Cruz had mentioned to us that um, she often gets stereotyped as like this feisty Latina woman. Mm -hmm. And she really wanted to play something else that showed another side of her personality, something that we haven't seen um, her explore yet on screen. And so that was exciting for me as well is to kind of push against these expectations and these ideas of who these women are. Totally. Um, you mentioned the financing of the movie, which I gather was complex. Um, in terms of using the international cast as a benefit, how did that work in terms of assembling financing and distribution domestically and with the international territories? How did, how did that work? We had the cast assembled and we went to Glenn Basner, who is the, has the greatest sales company, Film Nation. And we went to them and they're a New York company and Jess and I went into the office to meet with Glenn and we we kind of presented- And Simon. 
and yeah, yeah, yeah. Sign, sign right. it. Sign <laughs> and we presented sort of like, this is what we'd like our game plan to be. And, you know, we knew the actresses, we knew the, the scent, the sense of the movie. And we then worked with him to figure out, okay, when can we bring it to Cannes? And, you know, we went and you obviously get all your sales numbers and expectations of what this type of movie with these casts, it's, you know, a big game of math that I don't know that anyone truly understands of how you get sales estimates, but they do it and it was put together and we exceeded all of the estimates. So that's when we say like we were breaking, you know, breaking through, you know, and I think everybody for the past few years have been saying like, oh, you know, sales are down. It's, it's not that market really anymore. And we did not have that experience. We had a great can and domestically that was really exciting and very intense because we knew we wanted to remain kind of the controllers of it all, you know, because obviously in some cases you could just sell the world to a studio and then you become a studio film, but we didn't, we wanted to keep it separate and only sell off our territories. So we were getting like calls, you know, late at night in Cannes with LA that we were, you know, it was all very glamorous and cool and <laughs> people wanting to take us out to lunch and talking about how much they wanted the movie. We were definitely feeling very popular for those three days. <laughs> what do you think is a common misconception about packaging a, a film that's led by women at this type of higher budget? I don't know that there are misconceptions because I don't know that people have really done it before. I think if you're usually working with this level of cast, you are in a studio framework because of, you know, it just becomes a bigger thing. I think a lot of the times when you're doing ensembles, you tend to not be able to put together this level of star power. Um, but I think because all of the women signed on for the financial model, which means there was no, you know, investor who was financing everything up until a point. So there was no equity that we needed to pay back. We were fully funded by the sales. So, you know, from the get-go, everybody knew, okay, this is the financial picture. And everyone was very invested in making sure the movie got made. Because the other piece of the puzzle when you have an ensemble is having availability for your actresses, in our cases, and, and the actors. So we knew we had a strike window. We had to make the movie in that window. So you get the financing together, you get the movie made, and then in March, there's a pandemic that's closed theaters, <laughs> yeah. theaters around the world, but particularly in the U.S. Um, for an indefinite period of time. What are your worries about releasing a movie during these crazy times? For me, my number one worry is that people are safe. That, you know, is, is the most important thing in my mind. I know in Kelly's mind and Universal and, and, um, I think the interesting moment that we're in right now is it's ever changing <laughs> and you need a, set, a bit of sense of uh, flexibility um, and understanding that um, we really need to look at what's happening around us um, before we proceed. You know, for me, that's my greatest concern. Um, in terms of the film, all of the actresses are owners, you know, we're, we were a favored nations deal. And it was really important to me that, you know, when we sell, sold the film in Cannes, that everyone felt empowered yeah. uh, as members of the film. So, again, we are proceeding day by day and seeing what's happening uh, in the world and in the United States. Of course, the numbers per capita are very different in the United States than they are elsewhere in the world. And I sometimes feel like uh, uh, we think the United States feels like we're the center of the universe and... Um, there's a lot of other stuff happening around the world. So, and that was the spirit of this film is to make it international. And so I guess we'll just see day by day how it goes. Another movie you have in the pipeline is The Eyes of Tammy Faye for Searchlight. I'm obsessed. Um, <laughs> Jessica, what was it about the life of Tammy Faye Baker that made you want to make a movie about her? I just love her. I, I, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the documentary, The Eyes of Tammy Faye, and that's um, what our film is based on. That's what we got the rights to. I had seen it and then I watched it again in 2012 and I was moved to tears by 
her sense of empathy, her sense of compassion and humanity, her sense of makes me like even talking about it, wanting to wrap her arms around anyone who felt unwanted and unloved and to let them know that there was a place for them in this world and that they were important and what was unique and special about them is what was their superpower. Um, mm -hmm. And that's kind of like what Tammy marched to and on her own, what was unique about her was her superpower. I think there's a lot of misconceptions about her because of the way the media has treated women, because of the way that the media treats wives <laughs> sometimes in the past up until now. And I really wanted to explore all of that. I think we're living in a time right now that we could use a little reminder um, of loving our neighbors uh, and to wrap our arms around those that are in need. Can you tell us about the filming? Was it fun? Was it arduous? What was it like? Both. It was fun and it was arduous. I There was a lot of prosthetics on the movie. I got to work with the sublime Andrew Garfield as Jim Baker. And mm -hmm. I tell you, like we've all seen the stuff he can do, but holy Moses, he is so good in this movie. Um, the cast just across the board is amazing. Cherry Jones, um, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio. It's just, it's never ending. And um it was, it was a lot of pressure though. For me, I, you know, I'm singing her songs, disco Jesus and <laughs> all of them, which was great fun. Um, and also I just love how big she, she leapt into her life. And so I had to, after sitting for hours in a prosthetics chair, I had to enter, you know, the film set with as much energy as I could muster. So it was exhausting. It's probably one of the most exhausting things I've ever done, but I just, I, I was floating. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a very special film and I'm excited for people to see it. Good God. I can't wait. Um, <laughs> can you guys talk about some of the other projects you have in the works, ones that you can share with our audience? I feel like we have a lot of really exciting things and I'm like, I think we can talk about some of <laughs> Most, I don't know. Um, I'm really excited. Can you t just talk about ones that have been announced first? Okay. Maybe. No, I know, but I was like, do I go in order? Um, <laughs> I'm really excited. We're uh, we're doing a limited series um, next year with uh, Abe Sylvia, who wrote The Eyes of Tammy Faye, who's writing um, George and Tammy um, about uh, Tammy Wynette and George Jones. So we're very excited about that. Um, it's, uh, it's just going to be too cool. And I'm more well, singing, <laughs> more singing, more musical numbers. Has there been a shift in the past six months from develop in terms of what buyers want and what studios want when it comes to content? D have you guys noticed that? And has it affected your development process? I think for us, the, you know, being quarantined and, and being sort of separated because we've spent, you know, these years being so close together and, and um, it really opened us up for reading and, and processing material and getting excited about things um, that it, you know, it had been a minute because we were in production for a full year with between 355 and, and Tammy Faye. So it was this kind of breath of getting so excited about these books. I mean, we've optioned like podcasts and articles and books. Like we've, we've really in the last six months jumped into so many things that are really exciting and in all films and remakes. And we, we've, we've kind of gotten into a lot of things, which is so exciting because kind of three, five, five and Tammy was like, phase one of these like great ideas and these great projects that we were like so connected to and it's, it's exciting to be like oh wait super psyched about this one like we just got a script in last night that we're really really excited about and that one hasn't been announced okay. <laughs> it hasn't i thought it has no no you're right it hasn't there's one so. there's one that's amazing it's going to get announced i won't tell anyone you can just <laughs> But I will say this, I'm partnering with, I'm, I get to act, it's a two-hander with another amazing actress. So that I'd like long to, I don't want to say too much, but she's incredible. And it really is, it's going to be one like a, 
Uh, whatever. I'm hoping it's going to be a one for everybody. Yes. This is rude at this point. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me afterward. Um, just moving on to some big picture questions. Um, Jessica, you've been outspoken and very ahead of the curve when it comes to talking about the underlying sexism and racism in Hollywood. A few years ago, Octavia Spencer said at Sundance that you had tied your own salary on a project to hers to make sure that she would be paid fairly. Have there been improvements in the equal pay conversation since it became a flashpoint issue in 2017? You know, I think there have. Uh, in all honesty, and I'm going to credit Octavia for this, actually, because when we were doing the deal for our project, I had said, you know, we shouldn't talk about it. <laughs> um, and Octavia brought it up. I think she was at Sundance and she brought it up and then it kind of just went everywhere. And I was just, I don't know, I was just concerned. I didn't want the, uh, I was afraid if we talked about it, that the, what was happening would, um, you know, get credited to me in an unfair way. And what she did by actually talking about it um, was she really actually changed the industry. Because uh, since that happened, we found out other stories where, you know, um, uh, Chadwick uh, brought up Sienna Miller's uh, salary on a film. Yeah. And we hear, you know, stories about um, Big Little Lies, that they were doing second season was Favored Nations, and actually how easy it is to do um, and so the more public these stories began or become, which started with Octavia, I think the more inspired people were to um, mimic uh, that model that, you know, what she was talking about. And also, I'll tell you, shame is a powerful, powerful weapon, and I am not above using it. So, you know, if there is someone who isn't being um, fair and just, I will 100% believe that they need to be called out. Uh, when, you know, Michelle Williams spoke out in terms of the inequality of the, pay, you know, the, the salary that, that she received, it made a huge difference. So I think the more that people speak out and the more that others understand, listen, if you are, um, you know, paying people unfairly, do you really want uh, that to come out in a paper or on, in a tweet? And most people don't. So, like I said, shame's a powerful tool, and I also credit Octavia Spencer for leading the charge in, in making salaries public. Kelly, are you seeing a change as it relates to compensation among women, particularly women of color? I think it's I think it's now a conversation, right? I think it's 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 something that everybody is aware of, and at least when we're talking about projects and talking about cast you know, fair pay for the amount of time people are working and, and, you know, it's, it's important. And, and it's, it, it is a part of every conversation we're having when it comes to budgeting and, and looking at, you know, how we're structuring our movies for sure. What is a question that you hate being asked the most as a woman mm -hmm. in Hollywood? Oh, is it that question? <laughs> <laughs> I hated working on um, doing press for the help because we kept getting asked about like, were there any conflicts on set? And I never get asked about other stuff. And so at, at that, it was like 2011. I was just like, what is going on? 2011 was, I was getting asked if there were any conflicts on the set of the help. And then I was getting asked, what's it like to kiss Brad Pitt in the tree of life? And for me, it was like my, introduction to the industry and it's like people are asking me about kissing a male movie star and they're asking me about women fighting on set which i i those were the most annoying questions i and I, and luckily i think when someone starts an interview with me they kind of know not to ask me a dumb question so i don't really get those kind anymore i hope that's been the case here <laughs> um who's, who's a director you're dying to work with I worked with Ava um, uh, DuVernay on uh, the like the Jay-Z and Beyonce uh, video, and that was amazing. And I would love to do a feature with her. I think she's so incredible. Uh, or feature or miniseries or whatever she's working on. Um, she's got such a great voice. I mean, there's so many. What there's do you think, so Kelly? I mean, who do you think in terms of Freckle Films? Who's like your dream? Yeah. I mean, Catherine Bigelow is the dream for me, no matter what. 
Like that is just like the, of course, that's yes. great. But there are so many, I mean, we love Leslie Headland. Like there's so many great yes. female filmmakers that we were on like, keep sending them stuff to be like, hey guys, want to work with us? <laughs> we, we love to, yeah. But there's so many, so many great women that I hopefully will be working with soon. Uh, we have a lot of young women watching this who are just starting out in the business. Um, what's the best piece of practical advice you can offer to them? Just say not to wait for someone to tell you that you're an artist or that you're an actor or a writer or a director. Uh, sometimes I, I notice this from schoolmates that I, you know, um, that I've known. It's like we left school and then they kind of just sat around and waited to get cast or they waited for, um, you know, someone to tell them to write something or, you know, to to kind of have someone else empower them. And my, my suggestion would be like, what can you do to move things along on your own? You know, when I had the idea for 355, they weren't really making movies like this. And I, you know, that was something I saw as a big flaw in our industry. And I, and I thought, okay, well, what can I do? I can't just sit here and complain because they're not putting actresses together on, in movies. They're, you know, in a system that has been long cemented. So what can I do? Cause I am now part of the industry and I'm now part of the system. What can I do to modernize it and <laughs> to bring it into today and into the future? So that's what I would say. I would say, you know, you need to empower yourself. You need to ask yourself what you can do in any industry. If, if you feel like there are injustices or there are flaws in, in a system that you've been working in, change it. Do what you can and people will help you. Just just start, whatever, how, however small it is. Start making the changes and people will follow. And I would say, because, you know, the way I came up in the industry, it's, you know, kind of assistance and you, you, it's definitely like you, you walk, you know, you kind of try to go up that ladder. I would just say that the most important thing for me was whatever opportunity you get, take it, like, listen, pay attention, read the, you know, I remember being like, we'd get piles of legal like deals. And I'd be like, I should read that because if I read that, then I'll understand it. And just try to be a self-starter and anything that crosses your desk, pay attention to it. Um, cause you never know. It's just osmosis. You're taking it in and it'll serve you down the line. Thank you both so much for being here. And thank you all for joining us for this power of women conversation. Mm -hmm.